Well, I rolled up the sleeping bag as tight as I could, making it as small as I could so that it would fit into the old duffel bag that I pulled out of, of the closet. And I placed an envelope with a $20 bill in it on top of the sleeping bag. And then I took off the leather cross necklace that I had been wearing for about three years. It was made by a friend of mine and a gift when I became a Christian. And then said a prayer over everything in the bag and zipped it up. And a few minutes later, I handed the bag and its contents to a man I only knew as the guy by the bridge. It wasn't about the 20 bucks or the necklace. It was about helping someone stay warm as winter came on and to know that they mattered. She sat in the second row all the way to my left. I was still early in my teaching career and I would watch her and she had a stern face but her eyes were sad. And her body language, for anybody who was watching or listening, spoke loud and clear. Don't even think about it. She was one of six or seven kids, I can't quite remember, in the family, and I'm guessing she was at the tail end of the birth order by the looks of, look of her uh, hand-me-down clothes and worn out shoes. Well, the weather started changing and getting colder, and I noticed that the shoes had holes in the toes and that the soles, the bottoms of them, were starting to come apart. Now, first-year teachers, even second-year teachers, at least at that time, didn't make much. But I went to the, the store with the intent of buying some off-brand, discounted clearance shoes. And, of course, those weren't the ones that were on sale, or they were out of her size, or they simply were out. And so I ended up paying more and buying a brand name pair of shoes. The next day at lunchtime, I asked her to stop by my room before she went out to recess. And I gave her the shoes. The smile that broke across that stern little face said it all. And it wasn't about the money. It was about a little girl who needed to feel like she was seen, known, and important enough for a new pair of shoes, not leftovers. She had five kids of her own, countless foster kids, the occasional kid or two from a family member who needed a safe place to stay. And on top of all of that, one never knew what or whom my mom was going to bring home. She was known to bring home a stray cat or a stray dog that was dumped down by the river that was next to the jail where she worked or left at the door of the building. She was also known to bring home an occasional inmate that was in the process of being transferred or had just been released and needed a safe place to stay for a night or two. That would never happen today, by the way. Now, I don't know how it all worked, but there was always enough spaghetti for everybody. There was always enough hot dogs or hamburgers to fill your plate. There was always enough veggies from the garden, and there was always enough milk in the fridge. And if that didn't do it, there was always, always, to this day, a jar of peanut butter, a jar of jelly, and a loaf of bread on the table. Now, I can't imagine what my parents' grocery bill was. But I learned from mom it was never about the money. It was about making sure that those who society often discarded, human or animal, were given love and acceptance before they walked back out the door.
Today, as a church, we step into and begin our fall stewardship focus. It's that time of year we reflect on what and how we give to the operation and ministry of the church. And our theme this year, Extravagant Generosity, is one that encourages all of us to know what true giving is. Now, before you start to cringe at the thought of money talk from the pulpit, or before you start running numbers in your head and trying to figure out where it's going to come from or what we're going to ask you for, or getting defensive about what and how you give, just hear me out. If you hear nothing else over the next four weeks, hear this. Stewardship, churchy word, tithing, churchy word, giving, generosity, stewardship, extravagant generosity is not about the money. Extravagant generosity is about living into the fullness of who God created us to be. Extravagant generosity is not a money issue. It's a heart issue. That was a hard lesson for the man in today's text. We know him only as the rich young ruler, and rich he was, according to society's standards. He had wealth, he had possessions, he had status and influence and power. He had everything. And he worked hard and made a name for himself, and he was a good man. He followed the rules, he obeyed the laws, and he believed in God. Yet, with all that he had, it was what he didn't have or what he was still uncertain about that bothered him the most. So I invite you to hear these words from Mark chapter 10, starting with verse 17, and I'm reading from Eugene Peterson's The Message. As he went out into the street, that's Jesus going out into the street, a man came running up, greeted him with great reverence, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. You know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat. Honor your father and mother. And he said, Teacher, I have from my youth kept them all. Jesus looked him hard in the eye and loved him. He said, There's one thing left. Go, sell whatever you own, and give it to the poor. All your wealth will then be heavenly wealth. And come follow me. The man's face clouded over. This was the last thing he expected to hear, and he walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let go. Looking at his disciples, Jesus said, Do you have any idea how difficult it is for people who have it all to enter God's kingdom? The disciples couldn't believe what they were hearing, but Jesus kept on. You can't imagine how difficult. I'd say it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for the rich to get into God's kingdom. That set the disciples back on their heels. Then who has any chance at all, they asked. And Jesus was blunt. No chance at all. If you think you can pull it off by yourself every chance in the world if you let God do it. Well, the word of God for the people of God. The clip that I'm about to show you is told from the rich man's perspective, the one that we just read. He's reflecting on the words of Jesus spoken to the thief who hung on the cross next to Jesus at the crucifixion. 
And he's reflecting on how the words that Jesus said to the thief compared to the words that Jesus said to him. As the rich man reflects on that moment, his confusion turns to frustration and anger as he tries to understand what it means to give all that you have and live for Jesus. And I wonder if you can identify with his words or relate to his intense emotion. Oh yeah. No, I heard what he said. I heard all too well what Jesus told that man, that, that thief that he was hanging next to. And you know what? It was drastically different than what he told me. You see, the day that I encountered Jesus, I dropped to my knees right in front of him. He had my respect from the start. You see, I wasn't looking for a handout, okay? I explained to him that I had done the hard work. I just needed to know, was there something that I was missing? Was there, was there some good thing that I needed to do in order to inherit eternal life? And you know, sell all that you own. That's what Jesus told me. Sell it all, and you'll have treasure in heaven. <laughs> yeah, right. You see, I was always taught that salvation is a reward for a life that is filled with good works. It is not a handout that you give to people that can't muster up up. They can't muster up enough character to earn it themselves. My wealth is a clear indication of the favor that rests upon me from God. I had asked about eternal life and this, this disgusting shell of a man, he's the one that gets it. Jesus told him the day he died, he would be in paradise. This man couldn't bleed a drop of goodness that he hadn't borrowed. No, no, that he hadn't stolen from the righteous man that he's hanging next to. He was a thief and I'm the one that is treated like I've been robbing God all along. I offered to do what I needed to do. This man, offered nothing. All he could do was ask for mercy. And, and that's how he got salvation. That's how he got eternal life. It was just, it was just given to him. Like, like it was a, gift. Extravagant generosity is not a money issue. It's a heart issue. I wonder if any of us have asked such questions as the rich young ruler or felt that things were unfair, questioned why those people get everything handed to them while the rest of us work our tail off. I want to ask you, do you remember these words? For God so loved the world. Do you remember those words? For God so loved the world that he, what? That he gave his one and only son that whoever, what was it? Are you sure it wasn't whoever buys the most stuff? Or whoever has the biggest house? The best car? The newest cell phone? 
the person who goes to the Ivy League school and gets the best training, or the one who has the biggest bank account. No. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have what? A material life? A successful life? An easy life? A powerful, wealthy, perfect life? No. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And it is a gift from a generous God. Generosity is not a money issue. It's a heart issue. When we think about what the Bible says about giving and generosity... John 3.16 probably doesn't come to mind right off the bat. But here's why it should. Because John 3.16 reminds us about God's loving and generous character. It's really pretty simple. God loved, dash, God gave. God love, loved, God gave. Because God loves us, God gave us the greatest gift of all. And there's a connection to us as well in John 3.16, but we actually have to go back to Genesis 1 to hear it. In the first chapter of Genesis, we learn that we are created in the image of God. So created, so God created humankind in God's own image, in the image and likeness of God, God created them. Male and female, God created them. Humanity was created in the image and likeness of God, our creator. The God that in John 3.16 loved and gave. And so that being said, church, doesn't it stand to reason that if the image and likeness of God is that of love and generosity, then we, being created in that image and likeness, are created to be loving and generous. In other words, we were born to be generous. We were created to be generous. For most of us, however, life happens. Life happens. And we get lost and things get muddled up somewhere along the way. And our true selves, which God created, somehow become buried Amidst all the trappings of society, our narrative changes from one of love and generosity to one of self-reliance and greed. That's my stuff. I earned it. I don't need you. I can do it myself. I can survive and take care of my family myself. Now, I don't think we mean to do that per se, but circumstances life experience, and societal pressures, I think, distort the God narrative, thereby creating this perpetual lie that all of us buy into at some point or some time. And when I say buy into, I literally mean buy into. We buy, we consume so much stuff. It is now considered an epidemic, and there's actually a name for it. Affluenza. It's a a real thing, not influenza. Affluenza. Affluenza, defined as the unhealthy and unwelcome psychological and social effects of affluence, regarded especially as a widespread social problem such as extreme materialism and consumerism associated with the pursuit of wealth and success and resulting in a life of chronic dissatisfaction, debt, overwork, stress, and impaired relationships. 
The story of the rich young ruler is a prime example of affluenza. As are we. It doesn't take long to look in our culture and society today and see that we like our stuff. How many of you have stuff? Right? We like our stuff. We have lots of stuff and then we go and buy stuff to put our stuff in. And then we rent a storage unit to put the stuff that's in the stuff in storage. And we have our stuff and it's our stuff and we don't like to give it up. We earned it. We worked for it. We own it. It's ours. Is it really? The crazy thing is that with all of our stuff, we are no more satisfied with all the extra than we were without it. Research says that we are less happy, less productive at work, and less content in our relationships. The more stuff we have, the more unhappy we become. Why? Because we were born for something different. We were born for something better. We were born not to consume and buy up and take on more, but rather born to give and to share and to let go. We were born in the image and likeness of a loving and generous God. Therefore, we were born to embody love and generosity in the living of our lives. The thing that the rich young ruler missed was that generosity is not about giving up your possessions. It's not about giving up your status or giving up your wealth. It's about giving up control. Giving up the need to control our stuff and giving up the control that our stuff has over us. Over the next four weeks, we are all invited to take on what one author calls the generosity challenge and discover that it's not about money, it's about extravagant generosity. It's about living a life in the image and likeness of a loving and giving God. Living a life like so many of the saints that we remember and celebrate today. May God bring us into full understanding as we journey together. Amen.